Come, all you who carry heavy burdens, and Christ will give you rest, for he is gentle and humble in heart. In him we find rest for our souls. Friends, let us begin our worship of God. Thanks for being with us today on Trinity Sunday. We believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. We believe that our God's very nature is relationship. As people created in the image of God, we too were created to be in relationship, to live in community with God and the rest of God's creation. As we continue to be pained by the fracturing of our culture and world, we want to be informed by the triune nature of our God as we consider how to live our lives. As we gather together, let us delve in to the great mystery of our triune God. My name is Tom Abbott. I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church in Salida, Colorado. I have the great gift of sharing that pastoral role with Hillary Downs, and together we will be leading this time of worship. A few things to remember about our life together. I want to invite people to join either the Monday evening or Wednesday morning Bible study. Each week we're having a great time diving into our scripture passages for the upcoming Sunday. All are welcome. Come when it happens to work into your life. You can access those studies through the Zoom link that's emailed each week. Also, I want to encourage you to consider joining the Soul Food Reading Group that Hillary is starting up. The book for June is Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship by Gregory Boyle. Hillary will send out a Zoom link so you can enter into the discussion at the end of the month. We also want to thank Liz for being with us again to help us lead worship today. It's great to have music in worship. Finally, we will be celebrating communion today, so as we uh, begin getting ready for worship, please gather up some bread or some crackers, some juice or wine, then invite others in your house to join you for this celebration of God's amazing grace poured out for each of us. Well, as you know, we are in the middle of Matthew's gospel where he takes two chapters to give his congregation and now us an opportunity to reflect on what we believe about our triune God. As we think about what we believe about the nature of God, listen to these words from Psalm 124. Oh, blessed be God. He didn't go off and leave us. He didn't abandon us defenseless, helpless as a rabbit in a pack of snarling dogs. We have flown free from their fangs, free of their traps, free as a bird. Their grip is broken. We're free as a bird in flight. God's strong name is our help. The same God who made heaven and earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Gracious God, how good it is to be gathered again in your presence. We give you thanks, Lord, for the beauty of the day, for the refreshment of yesterday's rain, for the comfort of those that we love. We give thanks for music, for laughter, for wildflowers springing up, for the sound of the river as it rushes through town. We give thanks for your word as we find it in scripture, for the ways that it instructs us and challenges us, for the ways that we find you within it. God, as we worship today and as we seek you in your word, 
may we find you. May we hear your message to us. May we be encouraged and strengthened to serve you with all that we are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, and we'll be reading verses 20 through 30, and I'll be reading it from the message today. Let's listen for God's word to us. Next, Jesus let fly on the cities where he had worked the hardest, but whose people had responded the least, shrugging their shoulders and going their own way. Doom to you, Chorazin, doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had seen half of the powerful miracles that you have seen, they would have been on their knees in a minute. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. And Capernaum, with all your peacocks strutting, you're going to end up in the abyss. If the people of Sodom had had your chances, the city would still be around. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You have concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way that you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation, coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't, let any, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Amen.
As I mentioned, we are in the middle of Matthew's gospel. In chapters 11 and 12, Matthew placed stories for the purpose of encouraging us to reflect on what we believe about Jesus, about what we believe about following Jesus, and about what we believe about our triune God. Last week, Matthew shared the essential story of John the Baptist's doubt. His doubt in relationship to Jesus' identity. In response to John's doubt, Jesus lifted up John as the most influential human in human history. Jesus wanted us to know that doubt is going to be a normal part of our faith journey. And that even in the midst of our doubt, God is on our side. That is great news. This week, our passage delves into an aspect of God's nature that we Presbyterians often avoid. God as judge. Most of us, of course, are grateful for the judging nature of God as long as we get to determine who God is going to judge and we also get to determine the nature of that judgment. Our family was camped at a campground near historic Jamestown, Virginia. Our kids were about middle school age. Samuel and Hannah were in one tent, Deb and I were in another tent. About the time we got ready to go to bed, a group of four men pulled into the campsite right next to us. They arrived drunk and they continued their drinking. It was probably about 90 degrees outside and they started a huge fire about 10 feet from our tent. I thought our tent was going to melt. Their conversation was less than edifying. They did not seem like safe neighbors, much less neighborly neighbors. I lay on my sleeping bag throughout that night, praying for safety for my family and praying for God to strike down our neighbors with fire from heaven. It was a bit disappointing the next morning that God did not answer the second half of that prayer. We did make it through the night safely as a family, but so did our neighbors. We have all prayed for God's judgment to rain down. Heck, I continue to pray for God's wrath to pour down on certain people, people who, in my limited perspective, are detrimental to the rest of God's creation. At the same time, of course, we don't like the idea of God as judge in relation to our own lives. In relation to our lives, we prefer to hold on to the image from last week. God is on our side. Oh, how often we hear that phrase in our culture. We have a hard time believing that God can be judge and on our side. We like to think of those as either or. But as with so many theological truths, this truth is also both and. God is on our side, and God is our judge. We struggle with this paradox in relation to God, even though in life, the people who have most likely had the greatest impact on our lives are people who know us well, people who are on our side, and who are also willing to be honest with us about our brokenness. It is this 
theological paradox that God is on our side and God is our judge that we want to dive into today. Well, after the beautiful expression of support for John the Baptist during his time of intense doubt, Matthew wrote, Next, Jesus let fly on the cities where he had worked the hardest, but whose people had responded the least, shrugging their shoulders and going their own way. The New Revised Standard Version translates that verse, Then Jesus began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done, because they did not repent. Then, after Matthew's words setting the stage, Jesus began speaking, and Matthew tells us that he said, Doom to you, Chorazin. Doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had seen half of the powerful miracles you had seen, they would have been on their knees in a minute. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. And Capernaum, with all your peacocks strutting, you are going to end up in the abyss. If the people of Sodom had had your chances, that city would still be around. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. We know from Matthew's Gospel that Capernaum was Jesus' home base, also hometown of Peter and Andrew, and maybe some of the other disciples. Capernaum was on the very northern edge of the Sea of Galilee. Chorazin and Bethsaida were neighboring towns. They made a little triangle north of the Sea of Galilee. These three communities were the primary places of Jesus' ministry. They were communities with some diversity because there was a major highway that went through there, but they were Jewish towns. Each town had a thriving synagogue from which community life revolved. These were communities that had heard all of Jesus' teaching. And they'd experienced the amazing blessings of Jesus' healing ministry. These were communities that proclaimed their allegiance to the Jesus way. They, huge crowds were coming from these towns to follow Jesus. Matthew tells us that while these communities of people expressed their belief in Jesus, enjoyed the blessing that their lives had experienced because of their time with Jesus, their lives had not changed. That's what the word repent means. It simply means turn around. These communities, they had heard Jesus' teaching. They expressed their agreement with his teaching, but their agreement had not led to changed lives. You see, what we experience throughout the New Testament is that God's judgment primarily gets directed at the insiders. People who say they believe, but their belief had not led to a changed life. Jesus stated that God's judgment would be worse for these three insider communities than for the nearby Gentile cities of Tyre and Sidon, or the Old Testament city of Sodom, that great symbol of every human brokenness. God is on our side, but God expects that our faith will lead to changed behavior. God expects that as we follow Jesus' teaching, we will grow in love for our neighbor, which will lead to transformation, which means we will repent. 
we will turn our lives around. Early in my life, from watching the police show Dragnet, I knew the phrase, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. By its very nature, our legal system encourages people to stay silent, to not take responsibility for their actions, to never admit wrongdoing. We are immersed in this culture of silence and blaming. We rarely experience our leaders taking responsibility for their actions. We primarily watch the blame game day after day. It is unheard of to experience a person in leadership repent and then watch them actually live their life in a transformed manner. As people who are choosing to follow the Jesus way, it is imperative that we come to terms with the way of our culture and repent from it and turn in a different direction. We must own the fact that we are immersed in a culture of silence and blaming rather than repentance and transformation. From the first day that explorers came to the new world, there has been a culture of exploitation, manipulation, racism. Every one of us who is white is a part of that legacy. That legacy continues today because those of us with privilege stay silent and we blame and we don't repent and we don't really change. Right now, we again are living in a moment when our systemic racism crossed a line that has provoked national response. All the looting and burning is horrendous, but it's nothing compared to what our friends of color continue to experience every day in terms of prejudice and racism and being stepped on in so many ways. Doom to you privileged, you who have power, you who exploit others so you can keep your status, doom to you insiders, it will be way worse for you than it was for Sodom. Jesus' statement here is damning for all of us who claim to be followers of Jesus and yet stay silent to the exploitation and abuse of our neighbors. We in the church are the Capernaum, the Chorazin, the Bethsaida of our day. Are we ready to repent, to turn our lives around? If we wanted the systemic racism to change, then those of us who are white, those of us who are privileged, those of us who are in power, we are the ones who must change, who must turn our lives in a new direction. Our friends of color can protest, they can march peacefully or violently, and nothing will change until those of us from Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida decide to change how we live. Every one of us who is white, who is an insider, Jesus challenges us with the judgment of God to repent, to turn our lives around, to stop being silent, to stop blaming. Jesus calls us to become new people, people who actively love, love by putting others before ourselves, by not insisting on our own way. Fighting racism begins when those of us with privilege
privilege, love our neighbor by putting them first. After stressing this radical way of living, this way of loving our neighbor sacrificially, this way of repentance, after stressing that this beautiful way of life comes directly from God, Jesus then said, Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. All of us who are white know the burden, the yoke that goes with maintaining our privilege, our insider status, all at the cost of other people's lives. We are tired, worn out by the work of maintaining our place of status. To realize the great reality of this, all we have to do is remember the talk. You know the talk you had with your kids? For those of us who are white, the talk is about sex. For all our friends who are black or brown, the talk is about how to stay alive when interacting with the police or with the justice system or when going for a run or just walking through a park or just opening your front door. Every parent should have the scary, joyful experience of talking to their kid about sex. No parent should have to have a conversation with their kid about how to stay alive every time they go out their front door. It is a great burden for us to keep our status of privilege. Jesus teaches us here that the yoke of loving our neighbor well, standing up for our neighbor, speaking out for our neighbor, is much lighter than carrying the burden of privilege. A burden that Jesus states might just weigh us down for eternity. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Loving our neighbor well brings a lightness, a freedom, a joy for life much more beautiful, much more life-giving than maintaining our privilege. My dear friends, as we gather at our Lord's table, let us turn our lives over to the power of repentance. Let us be people willing to turn our lives around and live in a new way, a way that boldly stands up for all of God's creation. As Liz plays, I invite all of us to take some time to be in silent reflection, reflecting on the fact that our God is a God who is on our side and is also our judge. And as we think about the brokenness of our world, we need to repent for our role in it. Let us reflect on the amazing grace of God and the gift that it is for our lives.
beautiful things about this table, this communion table, is that when we set the table with this bread and this cup, Jesus shows up always. It might be in the midst of a joyful celebration, like a wedding, where we take part in this meal together, or it might be in the middle of a storm, much like the storminess in our world right now. And Jesus says, no matter the circumstance, to each and every one of us, come and rest, come and be filled, come and eat with me. Jesus does not hold himself back from anyone. No matter who they are, no matter their nation of origin, no matter their language or the color of their skin. It doesn't matter if you have been following Jesus all of your life or if you're still trying to figure out what you think about him. All are invited to this table with Jesus. All people are welcome here. We're told that on the night of his arrest that Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this and remember me. And scripture tells us that in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said to his disciples, this is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Do this and remember me. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you here and now in the midst of our everyday life, lives that are full of beauty and goodness, but also sometimes full of devastating loss, of nauseating injustice, or deep brokenness. We come to you, Lord, at this table with our joys and our gratitude, and we come to you as well with our heartbreak. We trust that we can bring it and not be turned away, that you will listen and hear, that you will take and hold it, that you will bring healing to us and to our world, even if it is step by step and piece by piece. We come to this table and we ask that you challenge us here, that you urge us here, to be the people that you've created us and that you intend us to be in this world. God, we come first today in confession. We confess, Lord, the ways that we have participated in the racism that seeps through our nation like a sickness. We confess, Lord, the ways that we have gossiped and slandered, the ways that we have failed to honor your image and other people through the words that we have said. We confess, Lord, the ways that we have been silent when we should have spoken. Heal us, we pray, God. And we are grateful beyond what we can say that your grace is extended to us, that you do forgive us and welcome us here. May we not take that gift lightly. May we live a turned around life. God, we come today too and we pray for those that we know who are hurting. We lift to you, Lord, those we know who are struggling with illness in the hospital.
We pray for those who are going through cancer treatments. We pray for those with bodies that are healing from surgeries. We pray for those whose bodies are fighting the coronavirus. We lift to you, Lord, those who are struggling in their relationships, parents with kids, spouses with one another. We lift to you, God, those who are under stress at their workplace, those who are under stress because they can't find work or enough work. For those whose housing situation is unstable. God, we lift to you those who are going through transitions in life. New jobs. New locations. New relationships. New babies. Through it all, Lord, you are here. And we come to this table to be with you. And we are grateful for your spirit who is always with us. And Lord, as we eat this bread and drink this cup today, we pray that no matter where we are this morning, that we feel your presence uniting us with one another, reminding us that we are not alone, that we are your church together. And we pray all of this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And I encourage you, ask you now, invite you now to go ahead and take your bread or your cracker, whatever it is that you have, and break it. Uh, dip it in your cup of juice or wine or whatever it is that you have to drink and eat that. Make sure that if there are others there with you in your home, that you um, serve one another as well, just as Christ has served us. The Apostle Paul reminded us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. And join with me now in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One of the great gifts of being together in community is that we get to celebrate each other's lives. 
And I think it's very important for us to celebrate Hillary's life today. A couple weeks ago was the 14th anniversary of her time serving here as your pastor. And yesterday she celebrated her 50th birthday. So I think today it'd be great if we could take a moment to celebrate the way that Hillary has blessed our community. Liz is going to help us sing happy birthday to Hillary today. So let's sing together, if you will. Let's join wherever we are. So if you get a chance, send a note to Hillary this week or give her a call. Please do that. Well, as we go from this time of worship today, I hope each of us will continue to think about who we are called to be as Christ people and how we might need to turn our lives around so that we are loving all of our neighbors well. And as we continue to think about that, if you have the benediction that we have been saying sometimes together, I invite you to join me in saying that benediction as we end this time of worship. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indwells you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe it and go in his grace and power. The peace of Christ be with each of us. Blessings on your day. <laughs>